A uh, little bit of a different type of episode this week. It's not really about policy, not necessarily about politics or news of the day. Um, I thought we would talk to a guy who's a friend of mine who uh, I find to be quite an inspiring person, both in terms of the business he's built, but also in terms of the challenges that he's overcoming and the way that he's uh, taken those challenges on. I think you'll find his story uh, really quite compelling. And so I'm delighted, uh, for those of you who don't know who Philip Stutz is, I'm delighted to introduce him to you and uh, do that through this podcast uh, and have this time together uh, for you to uh, hear from him. Um, I have him on and have ex- actually have him here in the studio uh, here in Austin, which is uh, third third time we've had a, a live guest, which is, is great. It's a much better way to do a podcast episode. So I uh, uh, always prefer folks uh, in person uh, as they come through Austin. But uh, one of the primary reasons I did want to have him on is he just uh, wrote his first book, which has become a bestseller. It's called Fire Them Now, The Seven Lies Digital Marketers Sell, and the truth about political strategies that help businesses win. It's a, a great read. He sent me an early copy. I had a chance to go through it. It's um, really smart, really timely, very valuable, I think, to, to most people. Uh, lessons he's learned in politics and business and how to apply them in the digital marketplace. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that book in, in some depth because I think there's a lot of really good lessons in, in the book. Um, but one of the things about Philip that is um, both unfortunate but also uh, pretty inspiring is he has a very rare disease. Uh, and um, he's had it for several years and uh, kind of had a, a bit of an epiphany himself the last year and a half and has uh, you know, kind of made a, a, a pretty um, – interesting decision about uh, his disease. And I want uh, I want you to hear about that um, because while his disease is unique to him and it, it, the situation is unique to him, uh, there may be some parallels in your own life about uh, taking on a challenge and doing, doing things uh, in a bold and direct way. Um, uh, you know, kind of uh, creating your own moonshot, which is a word he, he uses often. And we'll talk about that, uh, uh, the diagnosis he has, the prognosis he has, uh, what it's done to him, what his future looks like. Uh, and we'll talk about the business that he's built just in the last three years. Now it has 20 employees and is succeeding uh, in a pretty considerable way. Philip Stutz is a, is a great person, and um, uh, I'm, I'm really proud to call him a friend of mine, and I'm really proud that he's a, a guest here on this, uh, this podcast in, in person in Austin. So uh, when we come back, uh, we'll have a, a good conversation with Philip Stutz for the rest of this episode. Um, I do want to, as I always do each week, uh, thank you so much for, for listening and supporting the podcast, for sending such uh, positive uh, vibes back to us about the episodes we had two good episodes last week, uh, pushed us all the way up to 99 five-star ratings in the iTunes store. Love to get that above 100. If you would, go into the iTunes store and give us a five-star review. We want to keep this podcast going and keep making it more available to more people. And that's one of the easiest ways for people to find the podcast if they don't already know about it. So just Google Mac on Politics, iTunes, go to that link, give us a five-star review. It'll take you 30 seconds or less. If you're interested in uh, sponsoring this podcast or learning more about that for your, yourself or for one of your clients, contact me directly, Matt at MacOnPolitics.com, Matt, M-A-T-T at MacOnPolitics.com. When we come back, my guest will be Philip Stutz, live in Austin, Texas. Be right back. This is Mac on Politics. I want to welcome to the Mac on Politics, National Politics Podcast, produced in association with the Washington Times, uh, my friend Philip Stutz, who is joining me in studio, live in Austin. Uh, this is the third guest I've had do a live podcast. Uh, first was Roger Stone, and then the second was Olivia Messer of the Daily Beast. So I'm glad to have Philip uh, here in studio. Uh, Philip is the founder and CEO of Go Big Media Inc., which is a thriving media firm, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about his business and what he does. Uh, but he's he's a, a veteran of, of five presidential campaigns on the Republican side, so he's been around the block. Um, but he, perhaps most interestingly, he's the author of a new book that's become a bestseller that I really want to talk to him about. And it's called Fire Them Now, The Seven Lies Digital Marketers Sell. Philip, how are you? Hey, Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, man. Good to Happy have to you be in Austin. Good to have you back in Austin. Yeah, um, and uh, you've had a lot going on. I know you've been been running around. You're in New York and L.A. and um, doing book promotion. And uh, I know you you got uh, quite a good amount of feedback just since, since the book's been out. I guess why don't you start by just telling us um, a little bit about why you decided to do a book, why you thought this subject made sense for you, and kind of what you were trying to achieve with it. Yeah, so you know, we've been. I've been in. I started my digital marketing, uh, political digital marketing firm in 2015, 
and we built it very quickly, very fast. We went from two employees to 20. Uh, we ended up picking up a, a couple of the presidential campaigns in the last cycle. Uh, we were doing a bunch of other races. We had a lot of success. But along the way, um, I kept talking to CEOs. Uh, and In fact, it's been over 100 at this point, and they all – started telling me about these frustrations they had with digital marketers and they were always curious how we did it in politics and as i was going through all of that stuff i was like oh my gosh the digital marketers on the corporate front are literally lying and stealing from their from the businesses that are hiring them and the reason i came up with that conclusion is because i started comparing how we do it in politics now i love you know everybody loves to say how in politics we're all corrupt and everything which is you know total bs but uh what was interesting was that in and in so you know we lay out these seven lies that sort of corporate marketers are telling businesses and then along the way of this process matt uh, I had a buddy of mine who's the CEO of a real estate development company out in Hawaii, and he's like, I am so intrigued by how you guys win elections. I'm wondering if I could apply that to my business. And I said, well, let's go for it. And so we did. And I think you know we had, a, I think, a 700% or maybe it was a 7,000% increase uh, in the outcome that he had, he had asked for. Mm. And um, it was just – it was we were through the roof. Um, and I went, man, there's something here. What we're doing in politics is uh, – and how we approach political campaigns and the principles we utilize could be incredibly valuable to businesses. And so we started picking up more corporate uh, business. And along the way – and the, the, the title of the book actually came from – I was in China uh, with a, uh, the founder of the X Prize last summer, a guy named Peter Diamandis, and we had another – Fortune 500 CEO, and he and I were sitting next to each other uh, in uh, Shanghai going to some startup uh, tech company to, 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 um, to have meetings. And he asked me, you know, he was telling me the exact same frustration that I heard from every other CEO. And, and I looked at him and he told me this one story. And I looked at him and I said, why don't you just fire them now? And I was like, oh, <laughs> That's the that's the title of the book, and so uh, began writing uh, in July and just pounded it out and uh, and and got it out, and we put it out uh, last week, and yeah, it ran up uh, bestseller list already, and so it's been great uh, great success so far. We're real excited. Yeah, you know it's interesting because there's. Um you know, politics and business are different, and um, they have you know some similarities, and, and in, in many cases, businesses that succeed uh, can apply, um, you know, political campaign principles uh, to it, and, and, and vice versa. Maybe in, in in politics and government, you can apply principles from business, and that can work. Um, and and I think part of the the kind of the idea behind your book, I think, was to take maybe what you'd seen and what you'd learned in politics and apply it to business. Particularly as it as it uh, applies to the digital space, which of course is innovating so quickly and is dominating things so so rapidly uh, in campaigns uh, and just overall uh, in the media. Um, so, and by the way, yeah. this book is not partisan. I, I mean, right. I, I, that may hurt me in my sales, you know, yeah. uh, because I'm a Republican media consultant. But Donna Brazil uh, interviewed for the book, and she blurbed the book. But she was taught. She interviewed about the 2016 hacks at the DNC when she was chairman, uh, chairwoman, and 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 went through all of those frustrations. Talked about sort of the. Uh, the the pro the communications plan they had put in place and and how that could apply to business owners all that out there and so uh, and the other thing Matt I'll tell you is uh, the the one thing I kept seeing in all these you know frustrations I said well I think I have to do something of value for businesses so at the end of the book uh, we offer any business owner, no matter how big, how small, the opportunity to go in and get their business completely audited on the digital marketing front for no cost. I'm not asking for their business. We do this absolutely at no cost. It's a uh, compliment, you know, sort of a free gift at the end of the book. Um, and it, what we do is we go in and we look at every, you know, everything you do from your social media to your website and we will grade it. And then we will tell you whether we feel like you've wasted money or you're doing pretty good. If you're mar if you have a marketing firm, we'll tell you if that marketing firm is screwing you over or whether it's not. And really the, the it came down to this. 
there's a lot of confusion on po- in politics and in business right now about where the, the digital marketing front. This book is not in a logarithm game. I'm not telling you go buy Facebook ads. It's not, I'm not talking about that. But what I'm trying to do is show business owners a path to succeed. And, you know, the funny thing is in the process, it's really also a political book um, because I tell these political war stories throughout. And really, it's the first modern day look at how political campaigns are being run. Um, it's not gossipy. It doesn't talk about what Jared and Ivanka are doing for dinner tonight. Right. Uh, but it does talk about what we're implementing and executing in political digital marketing campaigns and then how people can apply that. So you do have uh, some of the lies in here, and, and you go through them. And I don't know that we necessarily need to go through each one sure, of them. But, 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 yeah, it would take a little while. But let's start with a few of them. Yeah. Um, um, you talk initially about you know that you must innovate now. Yeah. Um, obviously, that's important in business. It's important in politics. Uh, it's important online because if you're not innovating, your competitors are innovating. Um, but but what lie is being told as it relates to innovation and, and kind of what is it that you think uh, businesses need to be doing digitally as it relates to innovation? Yeah, I mean, there. listen, first of all, here's the truth. The people in politics innovate quicker and faster and smarter than anybody else uh, in the economy today. And that sounds crazy. And maybe Silicon Valley is up there with us. But other than that, it is – there, there's just no comparison. The reason I say that is because we have election day. And the other reason I say that is because every competitor I have in this industry knows who my clients are and will use that against me if I lose. So I better be innovating and trying to win every second of every day for my clients or I'm out of business. And that's just a fundamental principle. Yeah. And where business or where, where digital firms on the business side get it wrong is that they don't have that. Their record is not exposed. The FEC doesn't require them to talk about what they spent uh, on digital, and right. he was doing those expenditures. Uh, at the end of the, you know, when a when a business is running a campaign, they their competitors don't know exactly what they're doing. Our competitors know who we're working for, and again, we're so cutthroat in this industry that they will cut my legs out from under me at any minute. And so, what that leads to is a industry and in digital marketing that is in preservation mode and not innovation mode. And what I'm, what, you know, one of the examples I give is that. Uh, there, you know, we'll see this all the time. What we talk about, my favorite one on here, and, and it, it, it goes against, you, you think it's some strategic or tactical thing, and I know it's basically, it's the first one. It's the contract. In politics, we have a month-to-month contract. Every political candidate I've ever had, every advocacy group I've ever worked for, we are month-to-month. There are no long-term contracts. Why? Because that forces me to work for that client, yeah. that candidate, and make sure they succeed. Whereas in the business industry, when I was talking to these CEOs, it was insane. They were being forced at a minimum, these owners, business owners, were forced to, in a minimum, sign six-month contracts, sometimes 18-month contracts. And one example I give in the book is there's a, a venture capital company out of Silicon Valley, and they felt that they needed to hire a, a digital marketing firm to, for one of their startups. And the digital marketing firm they hired forced them to write a $75,000 upfront signing bonus for, just for the privilege, I'm putting this in quotes, yeah. of working with them. And in politics, we don't get signing bonuses. We get win bonuses. If we don't win, we don't get paid, right? We have month-to-month contracts. And so on the innovation front, you can just tell the two differences. If the, if the digital marketing firm is going to be paid before they have any success for the client, how does that force innovation on them? Right. And so that's just one example. The whole book talks about Every you know everything's obviously about how we innovate better. Yeah, but that's just one example. Yeah, one of you, one of the chapters that you you have in here is about the number one priority, and you use uh, a Tony Robbins quote: uh, "Fall in love with your customers, not with your product." Um, talk about that. I mean, you know, you can sometimes uh, you know focus on bells and whistles and not on your core mission. And that's true in business, and it can be it can become a problem. You can waste yeah. money, you can lose focus, and it can cost you time and money. 
Well, I, I will freely admit that there was a time when I didn't think that way. Uh, there was a time where I wasn't purpose-driven. I was money-driven. There was a time when I didn't lead the right way in the way I ran my business, and yeah. that was many, many years ago. Um, but, uh, and I talk about this in the book, I have in a, uh, I was diagnosed with an incurable disease about seven years ago. Um, it, my, it's an esophageal disease. My esophagus will never work again the rest of my life. And a lot, that disease, um, has forced a lot of change on me. Good change. Um, and I, and I say this all the time that, if you gave me the chance to go back to 2012 and said, you don't have to have this disease anymore, and by the way, the disease may progress to a point where I have a feeding tube uh, in the next 10 years, um, I would take the disease every time because it changed fundamentally changed my life. It changed my purpose. It, it taught me to help others before I, I serve myself. And what I, you know, this quote is really it's about creating raving fans. And one of the reasons that our business, uh, the political side of my business has been successful is because our entire mission is to build raving fans. And in the political digital space, uh, that always isn't the case. Um, and so, you know, people have to move 24 seven and we always say in our firm, like we are available 24 seven for our clients and just that service mentality grew the company by 500%. Mm. It was, and, and by the way, 500% in two years. And the re and that's not, uh, to brag about the business. That's not about that at all. What it is, is that when you lead with the right way, it's just a karmic thing, like good things follow. And so, um, you know, again, what we find in a lot of business digital marketing firms are people that, that are serving their, they want their long-term contract in place. They want to put safeguards in place so the business that they're helping doesn't always grow too quickly, but they can grow just enough. And I lay out all these, 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 uh, things in the book, but, uh, i Ultimately, I think people on the political side, you know, we are in it for service. That's why a lot of us work in politics. We get a bum rap because they think everybody is corrupt in our business, and that's what the public thinks. But, you know, you know this. I know this. People that are listening to this podcast know this. Fundamentally, we got into politics to help people. Yeah. And that's why I think what we're doing in our industry is so much more than, uh, than what's going on in the corporate side. Yeah, so uh, as much as I want to go into the, the health uh, storyline more, given that you brought that up, let's come back to that in a minute. Sure. Let's keep going through the book because cause, um, I think people will be even fi find your, your health situation and what you're doing about it even more compelling as they learn more. But I want to make sure we, we go through the rest of these things on the book uh, that I have. Um, you have a chapter in here called called Go Negative. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, Probably the, the most fun chapter. There you go. The <laughs> there, there you go. And and you know, in campaigns, obviously, uh, voters sometimes can't you know complain about negative uh, ads, but people use them because they're effective, because they're memorable, because they're sticky. Uh, and um, you know, Phil Graham w w uh, was fond of saying, "The only vote you can ever count on is when someone comes up to your face and tells you, i 'I'll never vote for you.'" Um, and, and so sometimes that sort of negative messaging, uh, can be far more effective. You talk about this from a digital perspective, but also in terms of a, a business perspective. Um, in my mind, um, I don't know that I, I had thought honestly about how businesses could use, uh, negative messaging effectively. Is it, is it trickier than it would be in politics? Oh yeah, it's totally yeah. trickier, but here's the deal. The bottom line is we are moving into an incredibly disruptive world. Yeah. Uh, I don't think most business owners understand how disruptive the economy is getting right now. We are in a transformative time in our history. And, and one of the examples I talk about in the book is example that people in Silicon Valley and people in Austin, Texas would laugh at. It's, you know, the automated cars. But it's not just that automated cars are going to be here in five years and my daughter, who's five, will never drive. She'll never drive. Um, it is the fact of the second and third order consequences of that one single thing that is going to change the economy. By the way, the, there's going to be thousands upon thousands of disruptions. Yeah. Truck just, drivers, just for example. Like this. Yeah. Well, right. Well, that's one, the truck drivers, obviously that's coming fast, but what's going to happen to EMS and, 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 uh, you know, a nurse, the nurse practitioners that are dealing with car accidents, there, you know, 38,000 people died last year in car accidents. What, what's going to happen when we're now 99% 
safer in our cars. What happens to the car insurance industry? The one that's crazy, the craziest one of all is the fact that organ donations will go down significantly and people on waiting lists will die when we have no more traffic and car accidents. Mm. And so you've got all of these second and third order consequences that business owners are not thinking about in the sense, like I said, like car insurance. If you're working for uh, an automobile insurance company, you know, you're screwed. Yeah, now's, you're a, good, screwed. now's a good time to get to, to maybe right. you ma- should make be going a career into, change. Uh, honestly, in the life insurance business because <laughs> yeah. the life expectancy of my life will go from, what, 72 now to by the time, you know, I get older, I'm 43. I, I know this for a fact because I work with people in Silicon Valley. My life expectancy is 90. It's not 72, it's 90. Yeah. My child's life expectancy will be 105. Wow. That's how close we are. We're on the precipice uh, and I just sat down and listened to five of the most extraordinary uh, startup, uh, medical startup companies that have isolated genes. They figured out a way to extend life. They figured out a way to cure cancer. Like we are so close. I'm talking like ten years away. Everything is going to be explosive. And so, one of the things that, and the reason I wrote about the chapter called "Going Negative" is because it's a fun chapter, but in it's an outlier strategy for businesses. They should be employing a, a, a quote-unquote negative ad campaign for their own businesses. That does not mean you go whack some eye in the head like we do in politics. That's fun for us, but it's not fun for businesses. They, they lose market share. Yeah. But what I'm talking about is how can you figure out a creative way to use comparative advertising in a way that distinguishes your business and distinguishes your leadership and your company ahead of your competition? One, it's great if you're an underdog in the marketplace because underdogs always are fighting up, not punching down. And then the example, I'll give you a recent example, not in the book, but I just saw it recently. And it was uh, a couple of weeks or months ago. Uh, McDonald's put out a tweet and they screwed up the tweet. And the, literally the tweet said, insert copy here, right? <laughs> yeah. And Wendy's responded with, hey, McDonald's, your tweets are broken like your ice cream machine, <laughs> right? Right. You're laughing. Yeah. Everybody listening is chuckling right now. Yeah, that's funny. Did that hurt? Wendy's in any way, shape, or form? No. Did it make them look human? Yes. Did it make them, like, did you go, oh, that's a really fun thing? Like, it improves your brand by utilizing a comparative advertising strategy. Uh, the greatest example of all time, I believe, is the Mac versus the PC ad from about 10 years ago, where you had the nerdy Mac guy and the hipster uh, PC, I mean, uh, the, the nerdy PC guy and the, and the really hipster uh, uh, Mac guy. Right. And if you, if you go back and you look at the case study of that, that was right around the also the introduction of the iPhone. And that whole – bringing all of those things together shot Apple uh, through the roof. And the other thing was – which was fascinating looking at this case study. But uh, I think Steve Jobs made something like three over 350 of those ads. Only like 60-something of them were made or, or, or put out. Uh, on TV, hmm. right? What's interesting about that is he was so meticulous in trying to find a way. You never saw in those ads. He never said Microsoft sucks or or you know PC suck. Really, it was an ad against Microsoft, but it was like you know PC suck. Buy you know buy Matt. He basically had the conclusion drawn to by the consumer. In a way, we do this in politics. We have a lot of our conclusions drawn on by the voter. And so uh, he did it in a humorous way, did it in a smart way. And ultimately, if you're looking, if you're a business and you're worried and you need to get in the game because your life is about to completely be disrupted, you've got to think of outlier strategies. You've got to get in the game. And this is one of the, the ways you can do it. And I kind of lay out how you do it in the book. Absolutely. You have another chapter here. Where you talk about where the when the you know what hits the fan, and it's it's talking about you know sort of crisis communications and how to handle a crisis. And uh, as you told me before we started, you had a chance to talk to Donna Brazil, the former acting uh, Democratic National Committee chair, who was there during the last I guess what two 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 and a half months of the campaign, 2016. Um, you had a section here I want to read, and then I want to talk about this um, because you know if you're a political operative, sometimes you think about crisis communications only through a political lens, but obviously there's business crisis communications all the time. Um, and obviously the stakes in, in business are higher. Um, but you, you talk in here about why people don't, why people stick their heads in the sand to pretend nothing's happening when they're in the middle of a crisis. And you say that people do that because they don't understand two key facts. Number one, the faster you get accurate information out there, the more control you have over the way people react to your crisis. And then number two, 
Thanks to the rapid fire immediacy of social media, the half life of a crisis is relatively short as long as you don't ignore it. If you do ignore it, the speed of social media escalation will all but ensure your destruction. I think those are two really important points uh, about crisis communications. And, you know, we can think back to, the, the, you know, the Rob Porter story in the White House, how the White House didn't respond to, to, the, to those uh, accusations made against the staff secretary. But talk about that. Talk about crisis communications, kind of best practices, what we've learned in the age of social media, uh, but also as it applies to digital and to, to, and to business. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, we live in the age of Trump, right? So, uh, look, Trump can say everything, can say something. Everybody is completely outraged. And then three minutes later, they've forgotten and moved on to the next thing, right? And the reporters that are listening to this right now, I mean, that's the truth. And it's what I'm saying is this is we're ahead of every we're ahead of the curve in politics and businesses need to understand that the world is changing in a way that they're going to have to. So, look, if a business gets a bad Yelp review, they need to deal with it immediately. Right. It doesn't you know, it doesn't mean that some you know, it could be a lawsuit on that business. It could be anything. Uh, but the, the fact is, is when you address it head on and, and business owners are like in politics, we understand that it's a fundamental concept. And even then, like you said, on the Porter situation, people still put their heads in the sand. And so the point is, is like business owners are even worse. They're even wor- they, they, they all they want to do is say it'll go away. And we scream, you know, the, usually we get brought in my firm. Uh, when it's too late, right? And, I, and, and it's, it's very frustrating because you're like, you could have taken these 20 different steps and this yeah. thing would have been gone. It would have been over with. Uh, one, uh, a, an example I use in the book uh, is a, there was a startup company, you may have remembered it or not. Uh, it's, I believe it's barely still around, but it's called Bodega. And Bodega was basically a grocery kiosk that they would put in apartment buildings and on corners of streets and stuff like that so you could get groceries it's basically a drug store without you know on the middle of the street or in your apartment building and you didn't have to go out it's a great concept it's a really smart concept and it probably would have worked uh except for their name now here's the deal i lived in washington dc for 17 years i live in florida now but um we had lots of bodegas in the neighborhood. I lived in Bloomingdale in a neighborhood of D.C., and we had lots of bodegas, and I loved the bodega owners. And the owners of this startup basically didn't well, – they, they didn't understand that people in cities where these things would go have a loyalty to the bodega that they go to mm-hmm. because they, it's like the, the neighborhood store, and they know the families. And you know, I remember the one in Bloomingdale was an Ethiopian family, and they had this incredible story how they came to this country. And I was like, I want to shop there because I want to support that person. And then, um, and then the, you know, so then, uh, but the, the crisis came in this. They went out, and they, just like a political firm would do, they went out and conducted research right. on whether the word bodega would offend Hispanics. <laughs> when they went out to, to find that out, guess what Hispanic said? We don't care. It's mm. a word we use. So they went, great, Bodega, that's the name. What they didn't do was identify and research and find out what woke millennials thought. Mm. Because when, we, when the Bodega was launched, the, the startup, millennials went ballistic and basically shut down the company because they said it was cultural appropriation that it was insensitive to hispanics hispanics didn't care right the millennial Mm. millennials did right and it basically you're talking about a company that had millions and millions and millions of venture capital behind it and a great idea and it was shut down and you know they didn't do their work and they didn't handle the crisis appropriately and so yeah ready ready fire aim yeah you know exactly yeah and so that that uh, yeah it's a good example um so you you have a chapter in the book called you will fail and you talked a little bit about this uh earlier but um but failure in politics and failure in business is common and in many cases it's a prerequisite to success um how does that fit into what you're trying to do with this book in terms of of innovation and digital strategy? Well, you you find so many business owners that are paralyzed uh, in fear. They live in fear because they did something that didn't work, and then they get paralyzed and they can't grow their business. Uh, and you know, in politics, we pretty much fail at something every day, right? Uh, if we run a digital ad campaign and we launch it and something doesn't work or we do A-B testing, you know, we're testing different 
platforms and different messages and different colors and different pictures and all that stuff. We'll figure out what does and doesn't work. And we keep moving forward. We have to move forward because we have election day. We have to move forward because we have to raise money. We have to move forward. And so what I'm trying to instill in businesses is that failure is going to happen every single day. And you have to embrace not massive failure, but you've got to figure out how to have calculated failures and move forward on it. Uh, one example is my own failure. Um, in my company, uh, I, I am, as you can tell, I'm very passionate. I'm very enthusiastic. And when I started hiring people in my business at Go Big Media back in 2015, um, I – was selling to the interviewees, not having the interviewees sell to me because I was just so excited about what we were doing. And I hired great people, awesome, amazing people that weren't fit for the job that they were interviewing for, but they got excited by my enthusiasm. And at a certain point, oh, I'd say about a year ago, I realized I had to fire myself from hiring and so I brought our team together, and I brought the people that could handle it better, and I walked away from the hiring process in my company. Now, I am brought in now uh, if you're a finalist and we're trying to sell the company and trying to hire somebody, you know, if you're, sure. you're one of the finalists, that, because that's utilizing my strength. But it was very hard to realize that I was really sucky at something. Yeah. And because, you know, when you're the owner, you're like, I'm, I'm the best. I can do everything. But that wasn't the case. I kind of mm. sucked at it. Mm. And so I had to fire myself. And that was a massive failure. And it took me over and uh, repeated mistakes and repeated failures to do that. And, yeah. and eventually it was going to cost my business. Yeah. And so that's just one example. But this is what we're trying to get across to business owners. And by the way, another failure we have in politics, we lose races. Sure. I mean, that's you, just and, part of the process. And you talk about that in the book with, yeah. with Jimmy Carter and, and you did, I don't think you mentioned Bush 43, but he obviously lost a congressional race for you. That's you know, right. one, one become one, uh, the governorship. And Obama Robert, lost by 30 points in his congressional race, eight years before Obama, he, uh, yeah, and then Bobby, he was elected president. Bobby Jindal, who you know well and have worked, yeah. worked for, you talk about his own career path and uh, what, losing a, a governor's race in a pretty contested fashion uh, before he ended up uh, winning winning That's the right. governorship so um you have uh one other one other subject in here i wanted to get to in the book um before we get to some other some other topics um uh well this is not maybe not in the book but it's about the book and i i have had i've had the, the pleasure of having a number of authors uh on here uh, on this podcast over the 70 or so episodes that we've done and um i'm always curious about the writing process because my guess is there are a lot of people out there that are listening that have an idea. Um, they don't know that they can put it together. They don't know if it'll sell. They don't know if they can sell it to a publisher. They don't even really know how to go about it. And uh, if I, I believe I'm correct. This is your first book. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I want to confirm that. Um, but, I mean, I've had best-selling authors on here that are, uh, you know, very well-known to people like you that are just getting started that have had, you know, success with their with their first effort. Um, talk about just did you have anxiety about doing this? Um, how did you put the idea together and sell it to a publisher? And then what was the process of actually writing it like for you? So uh, I would tell you that uh, I got – my publisher reached out to me when the when the box – the first book of boxes uh, – the box, first boxes came to my house you know, like um, back in January and said, here's, here's the book. Congratulations. Isn't this the best day for you? And I said, No. The best day was when I committed to writing the book and I signed the paperwork and I pushed all my chips in on the table Yeah, because I had, I burned my boats, you know, that whole story. If yeah. You, you don't want to fail, uh, you know, before you take the island, you burn your boats right. before you take the island. That way you have no choice. Sure. And so if, I mean, if I'm really look back on it, that was the most exciting day I had in this whole process. Mm. Uh, was the day that I said I'm committed to it. Uh, yeah. I didn't realize that that's, that was uh, that was very interesting to think about. I hadn't thought about it. Uh, the writing process was the most fun thing I've ever done. I I I'd never I didn't think I'd like it. I thought it'd be laborious. I had an amazing uh, team uh, with Lion Crest Publishing and a, and a startup company called that, that's associated with them called Book in a Box. Uh, that's out of Austin, mm. uh, and a, a Tucker Max was uh, the head is the guy who started that Tucker. Um, Wrote, I hope they served beer in hell, sort of sold 4 million books, uh, New York Times bestseller, and uh, he was very instrumental in my process. Mm. Um, but ev waking up every morning at, at 4.30 uh, for five months and writing and then working with my team, 
was the most fun. It was probably more fun. I, I'm a marketer. And writing the book was more fun than the marketing of this book, yeah. for sure. Not even close. I, I just I had a blast with it. It was so cool to write about a subject that had not been written about um, and that I felt would help uh both people in politics and people in business. Yeah, so you get up early and you're writing what for a couple hours every day, I, I and, write then you're... and my brain goes dead about eleven. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So that that long. So really, that many hours every morning. Well, I wake up at four thirty. Oh, I got and you. I, 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 got I you. exercise and I meditate and then I you got know, it. And got then it. I go up to my, I get into my office about six forty five and got then I'll write so, until eleven. So a few hours each day, and then so you, you turn in a manuscript, and then what? Your does an editor come back and say, "Hey, it looks fine, but we need these changes," or "No, these chapters don't work." Like, what kind of feedback did you get throughout the process? Yeah, no, I mean, they, this again. Uh, if you ever want to write a book, I'd look these guys up because um, we were locked up the whole way. Yeah, I mean, we knew what was working, we knew it wasn't working. Um, I turned it in in November. I got the draft back in mid-December I wanted to get this out now and they worked with me to reach my timeline yeah and so we spent three weeks on the rewrite and, and all the edits uh got it done in in mid-January and yeah. then here we are I mean that that's how fast like typically uh the book process is you know can go 12 to 18 months yeah and we did this thing we started in June so um I mean it was crazy and so uh when you had the idea in your mind and you ended up uh, selling uh, Lioncrest on it. What did it take for you to sell the idea to Lioncrest? Did you have one chapter? Well, I had did a couple ideas. Yeah. I had a couple ideas, mm. uh, and uh, that this was the idea that they were like, "This is the book." Like, are you, th this is the book. Th this is an outlier because uh, in, in a society that is putting down politics, it's it's a different way to look at how politics can help businesses and instead of ignoring politics yeah you know, and i use this example i think for too long matt uh politics has been looked at as the david versus the business world and in the, in the marketing spe sector is the goliath and and the stereotype is you know the guys that work in digital marketing and the business in the, in the corporate marketing sphere uh they're the guys in the t-shirts uh, they're the guys, you know, in the flip flops and t-shirts and wearing hats to work every day. And in the, in the mark, you know, in the political marketing space, especially on the Republican side, it's like the penny loafer, the, the blazer, the, the Brooks brother stereotype. And, and that may be the stereotype, but it's a busted stereotype. It's not true. And what we're doing on the Republican side, and really Democrats are doing it too on the market, on the digital side, it's 10 times more innovative than what I'm ever seeing on the corporate side. Right. Um, okay, so let's, um, let's turn to, to your personal health uh, situation, which you previewed a little bit there earlier. Um, it's, uh, it's obviously, you know, a heady thing um, for you to be going through, particularly as you, you know, have a family with young kids you have a business that's growing, you have a personal life, you know, I think about just my own life and how complicated my life is and, and to not have uh, that kind of challenge, uh, you know, I wonder how, how, how you're able to, to get through it. So just as a kind of a, uh, just to start off here, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, that you did is in March of, of 2017, you wrote a piece for Inc. Magazine or I guess you were interviewed uh, by someone at Inc. Magazine, Bill Carmody, uh, who's a founder and CEO of a company called TreePoint, um, about what you're calling the, the moonshot, which is uh, this personal mission you have not to just survive your disease or to live well or to live as long as possible, but really to, to, to cure uh, a really, really rare disease that you have. Uh, and it's a fascinating thing to read. Uh, it's called Embrace the Change That's Coming. You can find it at, on, the, on the Inc. site. And then you've followed that through with, uh, with writing about uh, your, your situation and, and given several, several updates, uh, which I know you can find at uh, uh, a site called Thrive Global uh, if you look for Philip stuff. It's also on my Medium. Yeah, on your uh, medium page yeah. as well. Yeah, so you go through it in great, great detail. But but let's talk about uh, achalasia, this this uh, esophageal disease that you have. I guess one in one hundred thousand people have it. Usually, it's older people that get it. So you obviously, it's like just just kind of go through your your story here. How did you find out what what was your immediate response? Tell us a little bit about that stage. Yeah, it's such a rare disease. And again, I mean, uh, one out of 100,000, usually people in their 70s or 80s. And I'm 43 and in really good shape. And so I don't, you know, I was like, I didn't know what was going on. I, I remember eating uh, cereal in my kitchen one morning and just being like, man, this is really hard to get down. And I was having to drink like milk or water to get it down. And eventually I went uh, to um, 
uh, you know, doctor. Ear, nose, and throat. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, uh, or, uh, and, and it took 18 months for them to figure out what it was. Mm. I mean, that's how rare it is. And I would have thought it was a, a acid reflux. And that's something I, I have and I've had sure. to deal with, which is very, you know, treatable. Well, I, I have that surgery. because they've shredded my esophagus. I mean, I cannot, I've had three major surgeries on it. Uh, I've had 15 minor procedures. Uh, I say uh, that my esophagus looks like an up down, upside down pom pom, mm. uh, cheerleaders pom pom. Mm. I mean, they've just shredded me just so food can get down into my stomach. But what that does is uh, acid can easily come up. And right. So, um, and and the diagnosis is there's no cure, none. And 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 so for five years I listened to my doctors. I went, I was at Hopkins, and I was at the Mayo Clinic. I'm at Mayo Clinic now, and. They basically pat you on the head. They give you prescription medicine, and they say, go, you're on your way, even at the Mayo Clinic. And this is the great lesson I learned. And I basically said, well, that's the, what the Mayo Clinic says, so I got to do it. And then I finally, uh, in, in August of 2016, I was in the Mayo Clinic, and the, my doctor says to me, Philip, you know, you need to understand you've had this, last, this third surgery. You probably can have one more. They basically uh, cut a quarter or 25% of my stomach out wrapped it around my esophagus to hold it steady uh, and then like stapled it all together this already happened yeah this oh. happened in uh yeah. in uh august of 2015 was my last surgery so okay um and so i went for my checkup and a year later and they said you know you can this this wrap that i have in my that my stomach and my esophagus basically will come undone one day it's mm-hmm. going to happen it's inevitable and you can probably not for sure but probably have one more surgery after that and then you're going to have to have a feeding tube the rest of your life and i'm like well what you know how long do these wraps last oh, it could be 10 years it could be 15 years we don't know it could be 2 years we just don't know mm. and we already know that it's loosened uh, that's that's um, been confirmed recently so um and there's no cure. And they basically said to me, you're going to be on a feeding tube if we, after this last surgery, um, you know, after it comes undone. And it really hit me because I was like, well, sh- you know, I, I don't, I, I, I want to eat, you know, I, I, sure. I'll eat healthy, but I want to be able to eat. And so I just decided I got to figure this thing out. So I spent six months getting all of my health in order. And really what I realized was that no one ever tried to figure out the core reason for why I had a disease. They just wanted to give me medicine and send me on my way. And it's not the fault of the Mayo Clinic. They have to see hundreds of patients every day. That's their mission. But once I understood that, I realized I had to take things in my own hands. Mm. And then uh, about a year ago, I went to a conference uh, by the XPRIZE founder, Peter Diamandis, and he kept talking about take your moonshot. And it was a business conference. So I thought, oh, I'd take this moonshot in my business. And then I realized maybe I should take my moonshot with my disease. And so I decided a year ago that within five years, I would figure out a way to cure this disease that has never been cured before. And so I had the piece in ink um, put out, and uh, we ended up, uh, somebody, some researcher on this disease found it, read it, got in touch with me, uh, literally just contacted the general email account at my company right. and called me and I said, I'm going to cure this disease. And she said, how do you plan to do that? And I said, well, I really don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to figure it out. It's my moonshot. But I have been reading about stem cells uh, curing and helping a lot of things. And she's like, well, that's news to me. Uh, but let me talk to some doctors. So she calls me back a week later and says, I found this doctor uh, at Johns Hopkins. I was originally treated at Johns Hopkins, but never heard of this guy. Mm. And he's been working on this disease for 20 years, and he thinks stem cells could be a cure. And I said, put me in touch with him. So I got in touch with him, and over the next uh, nine, ten months, leading into even the last week, I had a conference call with him. Uh, we are just on the precipice of getting the FDA to approve a one-man clinical trial where they would gr- uh, extract uh, calf st- uh, muscle. They would extract uh, my calf muscle, uh, a piece of it, and then grow stem cells out of it and then take those stem cells and insert them into my esophagus to try to get the nerves and the muscles working. The bottom line on my disease is like everything's dead, so I can't eat. It, everything lodges in my, in my esophagus. So <clears> – <throat> There, it's never been done. Hadn't any, this this uh, experiment hasn't even been done on animals, mm. and so they're like, we don't have no idea. But if you're willing to try it, let's go for it. 
And it, so you're awaiting FDA approval well, for we, the. We we're supposed to get it. Okay. And it would start uh, in the fall of 2018, and we'll see. And by the way. In relation to the book, if it fails, I'll go to plan B, which I don't know what it is yet, right. but I'm going for it, yeah. and um, we'll see what happens. But my, it all started when I just changed my mind and my mindset, and I said, I'm not going to sit here and just take what everybody says I have to do. I'm going to try to figure this out on my own, and and really, and as, as weird as this sounds, and it's a, you know, I'm not trying to push the book or plug the book but that's one of the reasons i wrote the book yeah was because that experience there yeah. was a parallel universe of people that were stuck people that just listened to digital marketers didn't do anything business owners that weren't doing the right thing politicians that weren't doing and i just said man i know this experience i know what it feels like to put my head in the sand and not do things i know what it feels like to fail over and over again i know what it feels like it's it's depressing mm-hmm I mean, there's a part of it that I was probably very depressed over my health for a long time. Oh, sure. And now, man, I mean, the sky's the limit. And if it doesn't work, I'm cool with that. And if I have to get a feeding tube, I'm cool with that. I got a family. I'm happy. There are other things in life than eating. I'll be fine. I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. But that mindset is what I'm trying to get across to people in their own lives now. Right. Uh, is right to try uh, part of part of this for you in the sense that is that is that connected to this FDA approval process or is that separate you familiar with right to try no, this no, no. okay this is this uh, this idea that uh, someone who has a terminal illness uh, can take uh, medicine that has not been approved by the FDA if they want to. There was a famous case in Austin. I don't, I'm sorry I don't remember the details, but there was a journalist uh, with the NBC affiliate named Shannon Wolfson that was really, really championed that for a person in Austin uh, who wanted to try uh, an experimental drug. And so I'm trying to remember where it stands now. I can't remember if the state, I believe the state, may, state of Texas may have passed legislation. I know that Congress has has, has been considering it. I want to say maybe the U.S. House has passed it, but it sounds like if you're not even aware of it, 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 it probably isn't related to your, your process with the FDA. No, but I, mean, I have to pay for this out of pocket. Wow. Yeah. So this experiment is going <laughs> to yeah. be very expensive with no idea whether it works or not. So you start in the fall of 2018. Like, How long would the process be once it starts? Well, I mean, they've got, we're going to take it, it, it uh, like in the book when I talk about testing. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're going to do tests. So we're going to do small um, we'll, we'll, you know, they'll, you know, uh, give me the shots of the stem cells in very small isolated areas and then we'll watch and see if it works. And if it works, we'll continue with it. And if it doesn't, um, then obviously it, it's just not going to work. Is there any risk if it doesn't work? Is there uh, anything, is there any physical health risk to you? If it every, work? the doctors will tell me some pretty terrible things, Really, you know, like you could grow tumors and all that stuff, but that's what doctors have to tell you. Yeah. And, and the bottom line is mo most of the doctors that aren't involved with me that have worked on the stem cell industry, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking to a ton of them. Um, I have a really cool team around me. Uh, they all say there, there's no side effects with stem cells. Yeah. Uh, they have to tell you this because they're, they're protection sure. uh, and, and the liability side of it. But really, I don't feel like – if I felt like I was going to be putting myself – Self in harm's way, I probably wouldn't do it. Right. Um, so I almost don't even want to ask this because you're in such a positive place right now with all of this. But one of the sort of natural questions I think that people might have out there is, and, and you mentioned how, how you sort of fell into a, a period of depression very early on when you were sort of uh, doing it their way in terms of taking the medicine and going on your way and not really fighting it and kind of taking control of your own future. Um, did you ever get, I mean, I'm sure you must have felt like, why me? You know, why am I getting this? Why am I not getting something that's more common? Why am I getting something at all? I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm doing things the right way. You know, did you, did you fall into that sort of why me trap? Yeah, I, I absolutely did because, I mean, I've worked out five days a week since I was 22 years old. Yeah. Uh, I, but here's my problem in, in the diagnosis is it ended up being, I mean, I'm convinced of this, there's no... Uh, foundation for this, but it, I believe it's an autoimmune disease. Mm. I believe I ate things that uh, that I'm allergic to that I didn't know, and like w when I've done a ton of tests now on food allergies, and I know that dairy is really bad for me. Mm. And I ate dairy every single day of my life yeah. until about a year and a half ago. And and then I you know I read there was a book that came out uh, about a year ago called The Plant Paradox. Once I read that book, it was a life-changing book for me. Uh, it's an ability to cure 
um, uh, autoimmune disease, I can't care mine that because mine's a muscle function. But if you have autoimmune diseases, this is this book shows a pathway of how you your diet can cure the disease. And that sounds hokey. I went on the diet. And since I've been on the diet, I'm off all prescription medications, which, by the way, I was wow. shoveling the prescription medications down my throat. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I had doctor – and the other side of this is I had doctors that were trying to give me opioids for the pain because I have a lot of pain. You still and, do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but – uh, here's what I, I said. I didn't want to do that. And Florida passed mar- medical marijuana, and I just got my card, and now I'm, I'm a medical marijuana um, patient. Um, and I'm not doing it to get high. I know a lot of people love to say that, but I've you know really been pissed at uh, the sessions and the, and the Justice Department and, and what they've come out on because the medical marijuana I, it's a one to one THC to CBD ratio for people who don't know um, it basically like my it, there's no high from it but it is like steroids as far as pain uh, mm. from uh, you know curing pain and I can put a little oil down my throat if I'm having pain and it goes away I'm not taking uh, Advils or Aleves I'm not taking opioids I'm not doing any of that mm. I get I don't get high and it's been an amazing wow. amazing uh, transformation for me on on the pain front and so um, you know I just I've just hacked it I've just hacked everything you know I my diet is insane like crazy weird but. I don't have to take prescription medicines anymore. Um, and it doesn't do anything for the esophagus itself, but it preserves it. Yeah. It preserves, so I have a longer period to have it. So that's why I do those things. You said something earlier, and I used to, you said that to me last time we were together uh, uh, on your last trip to Austin, and um, it's really powerful. Um, it, part of me cynically thinks it, it sort of sounds like, you know, it can't possibly be true, and this is this idea that, um, that you believe this was a blessing for you in a sense, in the sense that it caused you to change your life, your outlook, be more positive, be more aggressive, be more assertive. Um, and I'm sure though, part of you says if you could snap your fingers and not have this uncertainty, not have this pain, not have this, uh, hanging over you, um, that you'd love to go back to having that life before. And maybe you would just, also try and be more aggressive and more assertive and more, pro- more proactive. But I think deep down you feel like you couldn't have done that without this having happened, right? I would not take anything back, and that's the honest truth. Yeah. Uh, if you gave me that choice right now, I would say no. Yeah. Um, I, there's a reason I have what I have. There's a reason I'm dealing with it. Uh, I was a sh- – I can't cuss on this. <laughs> you can, I think, yeah. I but, was a uh, shitty dad, yeah. and I was a shitty husband for the first uh, year yeah. of my child's life. And – um. All of those things, I, I had to adjust who I was. I was a real failure in a lot of different ways. And <clears throat> the disease really focused uh, that. I've fundamentally changed everything I, who I am now. Mm. Um, I have to be proactive. It's just not a natural part of me to understand. I mean, I spend, I carve out an hour a week to work on my marriage. Uh, this is not to say, like, I should be patted on the back. It's that I'm really instinctually so bad at it that I have to think and and retrain my brain this way um and and you know the 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 result in that is um I, I'm I have an incredibly loving marriage um I I love being a father um I love running my company and the fight of this disease is 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 passion and um and it's purpose and so I'm so passionate and purpose driven I, I really am in everything I do. I, I would tell you if you if you and I went out and and had dinner. Well, I mean, I would have a very uh, bland dinner. But uh, <laughs> if we did it, I think you'd probably say, "Yeah, you're the exact same as you are right here." It's just the way I live my life. Yeah. And, and yeah. So no, I wouldn't take anything back. This is a blessing. This is meant to be. And whatever happens, happens, and that will be a blessing too. And that's honestly how I look at it. So two last topics as we wrap up here. Um, I do want to talk just for a minute about your career and your business, and you've talked a little bit about Go Big Media and the success you guys have had, which you know I, I personally find inspiring. Having run a, a small LLC, you know, firm in Austin for nine years, you know, I I um I look at at something like what you built, and I really have quite a quite a bit of, of envy, and I find it inspiring. Uh, the growth you've had, the, the talent you've attracted, 
um, the self awareness to step back and not do do uh, the hiring that you thought maybe you know you probably thought you were good at, but you realized you didn't have to do it. And someone else would be better. Uh, there's a lot there, I think, just for me personally to learn from, but I think from other people as well. But but just talk about that for a minute about running a business in today's marketplace, the need for innovation, what your kind of the arc that your company's on, and what your company does. Yeah, so we're you know the full service digital mar- uh, media company uh, in politics. But here's the deal, and this is what I think a lot of marketing firms get wrong and a lot of businesses get wrong is we are moving into an economy that is customer centric. The customer is in charge of everything. And of course the obvious example is, is Uber. Um, and you know, the fact that, you know, you, they're in charge, you can, you know, rate people the way you want to rate them. You right. can do everything, but the customer is always in charge. And I think, um, I, I think I understood that concept when I created go big. And mm. I just said, I want to create a very, client driven company and on the corporate side um we've you know we've created very uh, it's funny on the corporate side we're actually firing our corporate clients because they don't want to do things successfully uh, they want to be in inertia they don't want to take action they don't want to move and as quickly as politicians and we've just said you know what we're going to partner with companies that want to do it the right way that want to put the customer first i mean so many times uh, a, and I get a, a great example of what you're trying to say, but in the book is we met with a guy <coughs> who incredibly successful medical company, and he created an app for his company. And I said, well, and then he came to us after he fired his marketing firm, and I said, why'd you create the app? And he said, well, I thought the app was really cool. And I said, but did you, <laughs> did your customers want it or your patients right. or whatever? Uh, and he said, well, we didn't really ask them. And I said, well, that's the problem. And I said, how much have you spent? And he said, $60,000. I said, on your app? And he goes, yes. And I said, how many people have downloaded it? And he, well, first of all, it's free. It's a free app. And I said, how many people have downloaded it? He said, 1,500. And he said, I want to bring you guys in to improve the app. And I said, I can improve it right now. Get rid of it. Fire it. <laughs> the app didn't work. <laughs> no one wants your damn app. How about finding out what your customers want? And are your your patients want and then delivering that to them because that ultimately is how you're going to grow your business. It's not about what you want. Right. This isn't an ego play. It's about being a responsible business owner to what your customers want. Same thing in politics. It is about what the voters want. It is not about a politician that wants to come out and talk about you – know, how many times, Matt, have we seen politicians come out and say – you know what, um, I want to come out, uh, I, I'm pro-choice. I'm just going to come out and say I'm pro-choice. And you go, but you live in a district that's 95% pro-life. You can't do that. Well, I'm different. And you go, okay, but that's not what the voters want. You have to be true to yourself. I never tell people not to be true to themselves. But in that case, I tell them, how about we find the three things where you're complimentary in your district to your voters, right. and we just not talk about the, uh, the, the pro-life pro-choice issue. So my point is, is that, uh, we are living in a very customer centric economy, and it is going to be even. I mean, it's going to move, keep moving in that direction. That's the trend. I think I was fortunate enough to see that three years ago and put that company together in a way that really looked at the 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 voters, not just the candidates, and what the voters want to win are, are in their candidates. And then we design campaigns around that. And then we're doing that in the same thing on the corporate side. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's uh, really interesting. So <clears throat> let's wrap up with just kind of a, a, a talk about the future. Um, what what is in your future? You obviously have this book. You have this experimental uh, stem cell treatment that will start in the fall. Um, what are you excited about? What are you uh, anxious about? What do you? What does the future look like for you, personally and professionally? Yeah, I, I think I've always uh, had this, you know, plans drawn out for eighteen, two years. I mean, I, I've thought about the corporate side of this stuff for years now, uh, and then I put the book together, and then I think this is the first time in life I'm so focused on the book and helping uh, both our business and our political clients succeed. That I'm just I, 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 that's that's really what I am. But if I'm to look inside of there where I want to look, I will tell you this a million times over. This is not hokey stuff. You probably know that by now. But I built a culture company. My company is about culture. We uh, I'm about to. There's a chance. There's a, another book coming out on company culture that I'd partner with someone uh, pretty cool with. 
Um, but I believe that like we do everything we can in our company to bring people in that are talented and when they shine or they raise above whatever expectation we have, we want to crush it for those people. Um, and so we've got great examples of people in our company, but this isn't a, Hey, let's do a happy hour and show people fun. And you know, with that's not it at all. Right. Uh, we truly have built an unbelievable I mean, this is another long-term conversation, so I, I, we don't have to go into it. But everything for me is culture. So the next 18 months, I want to focus on making the company culture better than it is now. I want to 10x my company culture. Um, the only problem is I don't have startup money. So, you know, we, you know, I keep taking all the profits from the company and reinvesting them, which is killing my wife yeah uh but that is what we're doing right now um and i want to reinvest our profits into company culture mm. that really is where i want to go next yeah my guest has been philip stutz he is the founder and president of go big media you can check out his firm at gobigmediainc.com uh, as you know he is the author of the new bestseller fire them now it's the seven lies digital marketers sell you can find it on amazon barnesandnoble.com. Uh, I'm sure anywhere fine books are, are sold. You can also check him out on Twitter. He's a great follow at Philip Stutz. Philip, thanks for joining me on the Mac on Politics podcast here in Austin. Thanks, Mac. This is Mac on Politics. Really enjoyed that conversation with Philip Stutz. I hope you did as well. Um, both, I, I thought the book uh, really has great re relevance and resonance uh, to kind of the convergence of of business and politics and digital media that we're all living through these days. But then also just a really compelling and inspiring story of his own health challenge and how he's facing that and uh really i find that quite inspiring i, I think uh suspect most of you uh, did as well so uh really appreciate him making some time uh, while he's in austin uh doing some book promotion uh delighted to have him as a guest here on the podcast hope you enjoyed this episode if you would again go into the itunes store give us a five-star review i would really appreciate it i promise it'll take you 30 seconds or less it's really really simple uh, again, interested in sponsoring, contact me directly, Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, at MacOnPolitics.com. I want to thank my producers, Beowulf Rockland and Billy Bernadoni. I want to thank Chris Dolan, the editor-in-chief of The Washington Times, and his great team, including Adam Verkamen. And I want to thank you for listening and for, for, for supporting this podcast. We will be back again next week with another episode. Until then, signing off from beautiful Austin, Texas, for the 72nd episode of the Mac on Politics National Politics Podcast. Talk to you again real soon. Yeah.